This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. I still find it surprising just how often imaginary or complex numbers come up within mathematics when you just don't expect them to. In Calculus 2 or Calc BC, we learn about the Taylor and Maclaurin series for the first time. These are polynomials that can approximate other functions. And the more terms you have in your polynomial, the better the approximation gets for the most part. With e to the x, for example, as you include more and more terms in your series, the approximation gets closer and closer to e to the x. And as you go out to infinitely many terms, then you get a perfect approximation. As in plug in some real value of x into e to the x, and also to the infinite polynomial, and you'll get the same number out. Since this applies to any real value, then the series has an infinite radius of convergence. No matter how far you go from your center point, your polynomial will approach the value of e to the x. And the same thing applies to sine x as well as cosine x. But for the function natural log of 1 plus x, the radius of convergence is 1, when the series is centered at x equals 0. So as you include more and more terms, everything outside that interval from negative 1 to 1 just diverges, and negative 1 does as well. But everything in the interval, including x equals 1, becomes a perfect approximation. Note, I'm only going a few terms out because I'm kind of limited by Desmos here, but you can see the approximation gets worse outside that interval. 1 over 1 minus x squared also has a radius of convergence of 1 when centered at 0. But when centered around 0.3, the radius of convergence is 0.7. So now here's a question you may have never asked when first learning this stuff. Why? At least for me, I never learned why the radius of convergence can differ so much, and whether there's some predictability just by looking at the equation before you just go through the ratio test calculation. Well, from what I've shown, there seems to be one promising answer. E to the x, cosine x, and sine x have no vertical asymptotes. There's no singularities where the function isn't defined, so the radius of convergence is infinity. Whereas the natural log of 1 plus x has a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. So a radius of convergence of 1 makes sense. You just move away from your center point until you hit that asymptote, and that's your radius of convergence. For 1 over 1 minus x squared, same idea. When our series was centered at x equals 0, the radius of convergence was 1, which is the distance to each vertical asymptote. When we move that center to x equals 0.3, the new radius of convergence was 0.7, which is the distance to the closest vertical asymptote. So maybe that's it. Just move in both directions from your center point until you hit that first singularity. But this all seems to be ruined when you consider the function 1 over 1 plus x squared. This has no vertical asymptote, yet when centered at x equals 0, the Maclaurin series has a radius of convergence of 1. Then when I move to x equals 0.3, the radius of convergence is about 1.044, and at x equals 1, the radius of convergence is the square root of 2. So what's going on? Why these numbers? Because there doesn't seem to be anything special root 2 away from this point, for example. But there actually is. And all we got to do to see this is allow complex numbers to be input to our function, not just real numbers. So instead of the one-dimensional real number line, I need an entire plane for inputs, where the vertical axis is now the imaginary axis. Because if I plug in i or negative i to the equation, out comes 1 over 0. So those two inputs are the singularities. I need another dimension for the outputs, but for now to represent the singularities, I'll use x's, which go on the imaginary axis at plus and minus 1i. So now for the point on the real axis where x equals 1, our singularities are a distance of root 2 away exactly what we saw with the radius of convergence from before. So we were almost right, but instead of moving in opposite directions along the one-dimensional real number line in search of singularities, 
you actually need to move in all directions along the two-dimensional complex plane looking for singularities. And that distance will tell you the radius of convergence. And that's why at x equals 0.3, the radius of convergence for the Taylor series was about 1.044. And at x equals 0, the radius of convergence was 1. You wouldn't really think of this in Calc 2 because you restrict your vision by an entire dimension. So you never consider those complex singularities. Now I'll actually show what it looks like when we plot all the outputs against the complex plane. So the third dimension here will just be the magnitude plot. Note that this here is the real axis where the imaginary part of the input is zero. And that's all you see in Calc 2. But this is everything you're not seeing all the outputs for different inputs which do have imaginary components. And here, if I graph the plane y equals zero, you can kind of see that the intersection there is the 2D plot of one over one plus x squared, when the inputs are only real numbers. Same thing as before. Everything else corresponds to an input with an imaginary component, and at plus and minus i, we see those two singularities as expected. So while the radius of convergence can seem random when you restrict yourself to the real number line, since there isn't always something special that happens there, when you include complex inputs, then you can see exactly what's restricting your radius from extending any further. Now, I should add, especially for those going into a complex analysis class, that this isn't the full story. There you'll find you actually extend the disk until you reach a point where the function is not analytic, which has to do with complex derivatives. Then there's also removable singularities, but for basic functions like these, everything we've seen here does apply. And overall, hopefully this at least showed you the strange fact that in order to understand certain properties of real functions with real inputs, sometimes you have to look at what happens in the complex plane. That's it for this video, shorter one than usual, but to keep learning about various topics within math, science, and engineering, you can check out CuriosityStream, the sponsor of this video. This here is a documentary called The Secret Life of Chaos, which actually discusses some of the beauty behind complex numbers, like with the Mandelbrot set. Then it also goes over how patterns in chaos apply to computer algorithms, population growth, and just the universe around us. Another series they have related to all this, though, is Nature's Mathematics, which covers patterns and mathematical beauty found in nature, like is the case with the Fibonacci sequence. So there's a lot to explore on this platform for the math and science enthusiasts out there. CuriosityStream is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. But if you sign up by using the link below, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in giving it a try. And with this, you'll have unlimited access to top documentaries that I'm sure many of you will enjoy. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.